Thompson Watts on 104.7 FM, 94.1 FM in the FM Metro, the KFGO mobile app, KFGO.com, and on the triple, triple towers, towers of power, power the, the mighty 790, 790 News Radio, KFGO. You know, it's not too often in life where you can put a stamp on something and instantly everyone is there. There is no question. Sissel singing in the background means we're talking about the Titanic today. This takes me right back to that movie. Did you see the movie, Polly? Did you go to Titanic? I saw it the TV version. Oh, I got you. Yep. I remember uh, I was kind of poo-pooing the movie back in 97 when it came out. Like, okay, so the ship's going to sink. And oh, what could they possibly... <laughs> and I went to the movie and was blown away. I could not believe it. It dominated the Oscars that year. And that kind of began a, a thing for me where I just dove in. You know, I have a history degree, and I love this kind of stuff. And I'll tell you what, the Titanic and its mythical presence in our lives never seems to wane. It kind of goes back and forth almost like a wave itself. Uh, today is the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, 1140 uh, local time tonight in the North Atlantic. The Titanic will hit that iceberg, and a couple hours later, it will sink to the bottom of the North Atlantic. The Titanic Museum in Branson, Missouri is truly something to see. I've never been there, but I have been admiring them the last couple of days online. The world's largest museum attraction, the Titanic, and the man there that's one of the educational executives is Jim Myers, who's joining us today from the Titanic Museum in Branson to talk a little bit about the lore of the Titanic. Hi, Jim. How are you this afternoon? Well, it's uh, very nice to be here. I'm um, pleased that you reached out to us. Well, it's our pleasure. Uh, Jim, what a wonderful museum. Can you describe the Titanic Museum in Branson a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, the Titanic Museum, uh, I mean, it's very eye-catching. As someone comes down Highway 76 in Branson, we're right in the middle of town, uh, you are going to see uh, a giant ship sitting there on the corner. Our museum building is built to resemble the Titanic. Now, of course, we're not the exact same size because the Titanic was massive, but uh, it's uh, something that will just grab your attention as you come down down the street. But once you come into the museum, that's where the real magic begins. We have over 400 actual artifacts from the Titanic uh, at any one time, and they're not always the same artifacts. So if you come to our museum more than once, you're going to see a different exhibit each time when you come. Um, we uh, are very proud to have recreated certain areas of the ship. For instance, the Grand Staircase. Oh. Uh, it's built uh, right from the paper blueprints of the Titanic, so it's all actual size. But we also show uh, areas like a third-class uh, berth and a first-class berth, and then, of course, marvelous uh, galleries in, be- you know, in between. So it's it's truly an experience to go through. I, I still am amazed by it, uh, even after all these years. So Jim Myers, uh, education executive at the Titanic Museum. Why is the Titanic such a uh, omnipresent mythological thing that just stays on the lexicon of Americans all the time? Well, you know, when the Titanic uh, was uh, first launched, it, it was... Everything that was meant to be uh, uh, the greatest in technology of that time and power of that time. And everyone truly believed that that, uh, there was nothing that uh, could stand in the way of uh, some of the creations that uh, men were making at that time. And then to uh, then add all of the stories of the 2,208 people that were on that, uh, that ship on their way uh, to the United States, whether they had been on holiday or whether they were moving to the United States as an immigrant. Uh, All of their stories come together at that one moment in time uh, out on the North Atlantic. And uh, it's one of those stories that uh, you can't believe that uh, it it actually happened. Biggest ship in the world striking an iceberg and sinking on its maiden voyage. Uh, It's, you know, it's, it's just an amazing story. Was the Titanic too big for its time? Too big for its time? You know, actually, it's interesting you say that. There was a gentleman that was on the Titanic. His name was Charles Hayes. He was the number one railroad man in Canada. Right. And uh, that evening, 
uh, earlier that evening, he had been sitting with three other men, and uh, two of those men survived. And um, he had made the comment that uh, man was building bigger and bigger all the time without con- uh, being concerned with safety. And he said it will take a great tragedy for us to stop and reflect about where we are at wow. and how we are building. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, there was a series of errors, uh, and there were so many of them, I don't expect you to remember all of them all in a row for us right here, but an incredible series of errors that went into the tragedy that is the Titanic. Can you walk us through some of the just incredible amount of errors that coincidentally all built up to one big boo-boo? Well, even in its building, uh, you know, the bulkheads. The bulkheads were meant to be watertight horizontally, not vertically. And so they only went up just a few feet above the, the water line. And so they figured that if something was going to uh, damage the ship, it would come from the bottom um, and into the double hull. But um, that, so the bulkheads were, were an issue. Uh, the, the iron rivets that were in the front part of the ship where it's kind of curved, uh, they were not put in with a hydraulic uh, riveter. They were put in by hand. And the steel rivets were uh, much stronger, but they were they were harder to put in uh, by hand. And so they hammered in iron ones, which uh, were a third less strong. And so when it struck the iceberg, all of those rivets were popping, uh, just like opening a seam. But, the, you know, the ship was four hours late uh, leaving Queenstown. What if it had been on time? Uh, also, uh, you know, there were no binoculars for the lookout right. that evening. Whether they would have used them or not, being at night, we're not, you know, we're not sure, but th- they weren't there. And then when uh, Officer Murdoch, uh, you know, tried to port round the iceberg, right. uh, he actually uh, slowed the turn down, possibly by putting the engines into reverse. Right. And so from the very beginning, there were mistakes. And the iceberg warnings that were... Uh, they weren't necessarily ignored, but I don't think they were taken as seriously as they possibly could have. They really weren't. I mean, the first one uh, that the captain received, it was actually hand-delivered to him uh, on the bridge by one of the Marconi operators. Um, and uh, he actually adjusted his course. He went, a tw- he went 20 miles farther south than he had ever sailed before. So he believed he was uh, south of the ice, but the iceberg that the Titanic struck was actually 60 miles farther south than they had ever seen icebergs before. Uh, then the ice ice warnings that came in later, uh, the Marconi radio had broken down during the day, and their main function, they didn't work for the ship. They worked for the Marconi uh, company, and their main function was to send telegrams for wealthy passengers right. because it was a very lucrative business. And so when their radio broke down, they got behind in sending uh, those telegrams mm-hmm. And so when it came uh, back up and they got it uh, working again, they actually uh, were more concerned with sending those telegrams than passing on the ice warnings they were receiving. Um, And even one of the last ones they got, they told the other ship to shut up and keep out of there because he was jamming their signal. Uh, So they didn't even listen to him. The ship that could have possibly uh, come to their rescue, the California, was not uh, too far off. I think subsequent locations of where the Titanic actually sunk uh, proves that the California was actually several more miles away uh, from them. But because of all those messages that Jack Phillips and Harold Bride had to send back to New York and maybe even to London as well, uh, you know, working for the company, working for all those people that wanted those messages sent. So yeah, when the California tried to let them know that, hey, you guys, there's some serious ice, we're stopped, we're shut down, that just angered Jack Phillips. You're getting in my way. I'm trying to send all these messages out when Jack should have been heeding his warning. Exactly. And the Titanic and uh, the Olympic, the Lusitania and the Mauritania were the only ships in the world at that time that had two operators. The California did not. They had one operator. And so eventually he had to go to bed. And so when he was, you know, chastised uh, by the Titanic, he turned his radio off and went to bed. And And so never heard a word. That's why the California never got the message. But Stanley Lord, the captain of the California, sure got blamed for the loss. Yes, he did. He he sure did. And, uh, you know, we'll never know exactly, uh, you know, because there were several people on the California that said, oh, they woke him about rockets being fired. And he said that he was not aware of some of the things they were saying. And so, you know, it's just one of those things we will never know. Uh, 
you know, uh, my wife and I have discussed this many times because, you know, I, I think uh, a lot of us, uh, and by the way, we're talking to Jim Myers, who's an educational executive at the Titanic Museum in Branson. The Titanic will hit the iceberg at 11.40 p.m. Uh, this evening and uh, sink. But my wife and I have put ourselves in these, uh, in the, in, on, the, on board a couple times just in talking to each other. And, and when the ship was for sure sinking, my wife and I are pretty sure that we would have gone and ripped off a couple of doors off their hinges so we had something to float on. We would have found a way. How come none of these passengers uh, tried to uh, do any of that stuff? I would have been grabbing furniture from rooms and et cetera. Do you have any idea why that wasn't done, Jim? You know, we don't. Uh, there was, there was uh, you know, a few uh, survivors that talked about the fact that, uh, you know, there were people throwing deck chairs over and that kind of thing, you know, to be – um, it's something that people could float on, um, but uh, there didn't. There just really didn't seem to be a, a lot of people that were uh, kind of planning ahead, you know, as to when that ship actually went down. Um, I don't know if there was such a Victorian uh, type of feeling by a lot of the men on the ship, uh, because they said a great deal of the men just simply stepped back and helped uh, people move forward or get into lifeboats. It's almost like they were there to assist but not to uh, save themselves. And there weren't enough lifeboats. And boats, then, of course, right? oh, no, not even close, uh, which was, you know, something that uh, was not a law at that time. And so when you go on a cruise today, uh, and there are lifeboats provided for all of you, and uh, there is definitely a lifeboat drill, one of the first things they do on a cruise, those are all laws that were changed simply because of the Titanic. And the International Ice Patrol was born because of the Titanic, too, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yes, 13 countries came together to fund it, uh, primarily uh, you know, manned by the Americans with a little help uh, from the Canadians. Um, but uh, you know, they, they still patrol that area today, what they call Iceberg Alley. I bet. How come people didn't get in the lifeboats? You know, at the very beginning, uh, you know, uh, I, have, I have a lot of students that ask me that question. And I tell them, I said, you know, first of all, the people that were arriving in that area first were first-class passengers. They were closest to the boats. Uh, but when they got there, you have a lot of people that are not used to taking orders, for one thing. And uh, it was cold. It was noisy out there on the deck. And a lot of them simply did not believe that the ship was sinking. Huh. And so a lot of them said, you know, why get off this big, safe ship? Uh, into a small boat that's going to be lowered 90 feet down to uh, a very cold ocean. And so they didn't then. And then uh, so a lot of the officers decided to send some of the boats out partially filled to row around to one of the lower doors where then like second and third class passengers could be loaded. And uh, we know that those doors were open because they're still opened on the wreck today. Huh. But unfortunately, those boats didn't row around to those doors. Yeah, I'm sure they didn't want to get swamped. I'm sure that's what they thought was probably exactly. going to happen. What a tragedy. Exactly. Are you guys doing anything tonight at the Titanic Museum to honor the anniversary tonight? We will actually have a memorial uh, tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, we do it uh, on the 15th every year, and we have a memorial in our uh, memorial room. And uh, it's very, uh, of course, it's a very touching and emotional ceremony that we do every year. And um, uh, so we're, you know, it's something that uh, we feel very special about. Jim Myers, education executive from the Titanic Museum in Branson, Missouri. The Titanic will sink at 2.20 a.m. tomorrow morning local time. And we're remembering it here this afternoon on The Drive with Jim Myers from the Titanic Museum. Jim, thanks so much. I hope to have you back again and again, Jim. I deeply appreciate it. We didn't get enough time. Oh, thank you so much, uh, and you have a wonderful day. You too. Have a good night. Jim Myers, Education Executive at the Titanic Museum. You're listening to The Drive with Dan Michaels on the Mighty 790 and 1047 KFGO. Get the bathroom you always wanted with a tub or shower from Bath Fitter. Right now, they're offering 18 months no interest and $1,000 off your purchase. Plus, they always offer a free in-home.